views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Hey folks, nice to see you again. We're here for the Bronx Buzz. As you know, we're here every Thursday and uh, we take a look at uh, all the uh, different reporters that are uh, reporting on and in the Bronx. And the idea is to give you some insight as to what they're thinking and, and what they're writing about. And also you get a chance to meet them, find out who they are. Uh, and uh, that way we can all learn more about the Bronx and frankly do better in the long run. And so today we have two really great young reporters, one who has been with us numerous times before, the other has been on BronxNet television numerous times before, but he's joining us for the first time. So Anthony Capote from the uh, Riverdale Press, nice to have you with us. And Javier Gomez from Dialogo Abierto, that's the show, right? And how long has Dialogo been on the air? Well, Dialogo has been on the air for 20 years. Get out of yes, here. Yes, because... I thought the, I had the only 20-year well, show well, in the Well, actually, in the Dialogo, we did a special uh, 20th anniversary edition back in January, and we celebrated the fact that Dialogo came as a direct result of Bronx Talk. So now much, we're talking. you <laughs> are completely ingrained in the history uh, of Dialogo. All right, nonetheless, I'm starting with Anthony. <laughs> 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 um, but we are going to talk about Dialogo. We're going to talk about the great work that you do. Um, Anthony, let's uh, just uh, start off with you. Um, you are engaged, and, and when I had a private conversation with you, you said, hey, I'm doing this really interesting study about <coughs> landlords. So talk to me about why and what you've done and what the plan is for this study in the Riverdale Press. Sure. Um, so it was a really fun series to do. Um, essentially... It's over? It is over. There were, there were four articles in the series. Mm -hmm. um, anyone who's interested is... is so much more than encouraged to go read it. <laughs> um, read my stuff. <laughs> please. Um, but essentially, a, a few weeks ago, the public advocate, Letitia James, released her annual 100 Worst Landlord Watch List. Um, and myself and some other staffers at the Riverdale Press realized that we had four buildings in our coverage area that were owned by some of these landlords on the list. One of them was Harry Silverstein, who was number one on the list. Well, and, and I just have to interject because there's so, and, and I know this, and we're all sensitive to the dialogue in the Bronx. People say, well, Riverdale and the Riverdale Press, they don't have these kinds of issues, but you had four, four uh, in, in, in your coverage area. Mm -hmm. And it's important um, to know. That one that was owned by Harry Silverstein, which is the worst landlord was on the, the list. Was that the Gouverneur Avenue building? That was 3971 Gouverneur. Right. Um, I went in there, I was expecting to spend like maybe 30 minutes, talk to a couple of tenants, and I did. And 30 minutes later, I'm walking out and I'm in the lobby and there is a crowd of tenants that had somehow heard that I was there with wow. a photographer and basically said, we all have things to say and we all wanna show you things. And I saw some stuff in those buildings that made the hair on, my, on the back of my neck stand up. It mm -hmm. was some really gruesome stuff. Um, there was a guy who lived on the first floor, had to put metal sheets on the ground because rats were coming out of the holes in his floor and he had an infant child. And there was a man who had lived there for more than 20 years, raised his children there, and I walked into his apartment and it sounded like it was raining because of the leak that was in his ceiling. Mm. Um, and the hole that We're, was right next to it. Just in the, in the apartment. And, and once just you have that, of course, folks, then, then you get a collapsed ceiling and... Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, so um, so you, the, the, the story was, or, or the series was pretty much documenting these landlords. Sure, and then uh, what it turned out to be was kind of an evaluation of this list from the Public Advocate's Office um, that is essentially just a public shaming tool for these landlords. And that's kind of it. Like we published this long list, we put these landlords on Thrillist and Gothamist, mm -hmm. and maybe News 12 The Bronx will talk about it quickly, and that's it. And we kind of forget about it. 
but it doesn't really do much other than that. And we sort of looked at, or I sort of looked at, what options the city has when landlords are essentially abusing their tenants. Uh, you know, we have covered this. <laughs> I've covered it on Bronx Talk even before uh, the, the 20 years of, of Dialogo. Um, this story of, of Bronx tenants being abused by landlords, I mean, we have gone on and on and on about it. Through your dialogues, through your work, through the, the series that you did, do you have a result? Do we have an answer for these tenants? Uh, do we have a direction now we can all go uh, to improve these conditions? And let me just add, because if we don't, if we continue to have these conditions, these impact, and we all complain in the Bronx about our education numbers, our health care stats, productivity of people, all of this stuff impacts all of that. Mm -hmm. So that's my long-winded question, <laughs> but it, did you come up with an answer, with a direction, advice, something that will give people in these circumstances mm -hmm. to hold on to? The clearest result that came right out of the story was just last night, uh, Councilman Andrew Cohen, PA James, and uh, Assemblyman Jeffrey Dinowitz hosted a joint event for people living in um, in Andy Cohen's district, there are nine buildings on that list. Wow. Um, and that 11th. Uh, and so people came district. out and, and spoke, et cetera. You know, they had mm -hmm. talked about uh, more inspections. Uh, the city council is always talking yeah. about funding and all those kinds of things. And they're talking about, um, you know, the local elected officials, especially in Riverdale, tend to be sort of like a pseudo legal office for their constituents. And they tend to go out and provide uh, sort of above and beyond services, and that's what Andy I, Cohen is doing. Yeah. Well, I, I can tell you, because um, I mean, you cover part of the Bronx, I've covered all of the Bronx, many elected officials do those kinds of things uh, on a regular basis because that's the advice. Um, uh, then I'm not going to ask you to solve our landlord problem. We, uh, you, have done, <laughs> you have done a good job doing what you can do. The other thing I want to ask you about uh, before we uh, bring Javier into the uh, conversation is about this study. Now, you have documented, and I didn't ask you about you because you've been on this fourth appearance, you had said, mm -hmm. been on the show before. Um, uh, so you're in college, and you're working on what I thought was a fascinating study about media, and because and, we were asking sure. for contacts of reporters and stuff. Talk to me about what that study is about. So it's actually kind of a follow-up to something that I did a research grant for over the summer that I talked about last time I was on the show. I remember. Um, but what I'm doing is I'm currently talking to editors at the major dailies here in the city uh, about how they fill the paper every day and if they consider their readership at all when they're doing that. Uh -huh. um, I, I have to interject because I'm surrounded by young people who are working our crew as they always do. And the thing that I emphasized when they were asking me about broadcasting was it's always about the reader, the receiver, the viewer, <laughs> et cetera. And, and I, well, boy, am I waiting to hear this answer. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the, essentially what I'm saying, what I'm asking is, you know, when the editors at the Daily News and the Times are getting together and they're deciding really what is all the news that's fit to print, um, no pun intended, but do they think about who their readers are? Uh, do they think where they're coming from, where their education level is, what their income is? And frankly, um, you know, there's kind of a mixed bag at this point. Uh, well, well, I'm, I'm interested to know the answer um, and, and just, uh, you know, um, su suggesting in my mind what somebody at the Times might respond to that, what somebody at the Daily News might respond, what somebody at the New York Post might respond. And I got to add one more uh, mm -hmm. element, and I don't know if you asked about it. Do you think of the advertisers and what would they want to see in the paper, or do they not care because they just want the same numbers? That, I, you know, it's, um, at this point, I've gone through most of my Daily News interviews, and I'm starting my New York Times interviews next week, but uh, all of the Daily News reporters believe it or not, said that they don't consider advertising and the advertisers when they do it, but um, they maintained, <laughs> I, I mean, okay. which was a yeah. shock to me, frankly, um, <laughs> but they said that they maintained the church wall kind of thing, even though... M meaning that, that they felt very strongly about the ethics yeah, of what they did. And, and, 
even though they did say that every now and again they feel pressure from I'm sure. higher ups to got sell it. papers, especially at the Daily News where they just got a new editor. When the study is finished, you'll come back and we can talk about some Absolutely. of the details. Absolutely. Like I love right. doing it. Javier, my man, so nice to have you on it's the show. It's a we, real honor to sit on tomorrow. the same <laughs> set with you, really. Um, so just for background, because people do see you on TV, um, who are you? Where are you from? How did you get into broadcasting? <laughs> well, actually, I was born in Puerto Rico. I came to New York with my sister to study broadcast. I went How to long the City ago College. Was that? that was in 1992. Okay. Right right uh, uh, at the end of the Dinkins era, the beginning of the Giuliani era. I started working as a news reporter for El Diario, uh, did general assignments in the beginning, then I went to City Hall Bureau Chief, then I was police reporter for a while, then I was sent as the Bronx reporter. And I had uh -huh. a very small office at the Bronx County Courthouse. I shared it with the Daily News and the New York Times, mm -hmm. uh, and Newsday uh, was kind of transitioning, facing out right. at the time and uh, did a couple of things through El Diario for News 12 of the Bronx when it was barely starting. Um, then I went to work as Deputy Press Secretary for Borough President Ferrer here in the Bronx, and then Borough President Carrion. Back then, that's when my collaboration with BronxNet started because... Uh, so, well, BronxNet started like in 94, Bronx so just bring us through a timeline, if you will. Correct. So, BronxNet started like in 94 when uh, Adolfo Carrion came in as Borough President uh, they had the idea of designating one of the uh, weekly editions of Dialogo, designating, him, designating it as Dialogo with the borough president. Right. So the borough president came to sit, and I was one of the producers of that very early show. I think that was about 2002. Okay, so that, that gives us the timeline. Uh, what motivates you? Why, why do you like doing this? Uh, and then, the, so you're not still doing uh, traditional print journalism, you're... Uh, no, I transitioned into media, re media relations. Uh, I also have a private company that I run mm -hmm. where we do media relations for government, not for profits, and some political campaigns, right. and some very specific clients, the National Puerto Rican Day Parade, for example. Right. And uh, I had the opportunity to come in and host Dialogo starting in 2013 when Ramon Rodriguez, the previous host, retired. Mm -hmm. Um, let's talk about some of the interviews. Now, you told me uh, b before the program about um, uh, that you've done a lot lately about immigration. Obviously, it's on everybody's mind, but in particular, a, a Spanish-speaking program on, on Bronx and television is, is perfect for it. Um, what are you hearing? What are people saying? What are guests saying? You want to talk about some of the guests you've had? Uh, just give us something that you've learned from the, the doing the show. Something that we are very keen on Dialogo is that information is empowerment. So rather than catering to the mass hysteria and the panic that seems to be so broad these days, and also trying to break away from the rhetoric of traditional media, which is just mainly talking about the issues, but not as many solutions. So we have made it a priority to bring to Dialogo in the recent months guests that can share insight, intelligence. For example, these changes that are coming in immigration policy, in economic policy, what do they mean? How could they affect you? How could you prepare? Mm -hmm. So the fear and panic component is still out there, but I think we as community media, we really have to go beyond that now and start really, really talking about solution and giving people answers. Well, you know that I certainly am on board with that because obviously I spend a lot of time uh, and, and energy doing the same thing. And, and I find um, with what I do, um, my favorite shows, my most successful shows, are the ones where I feel like I've helped to educate the people in the Bronx about so a reality that they need to know more about. And you already mentioned what my next question was going to be. Every single immigrant or somebody who's related to an undocumented or somebody who is undocumented or maybe has a child, I mean, we can go on and on, is completely frightened right now. They're, and, and for very good reasons, because they're saying, my goodness, something bad could very well happen to my family in this beautiful homeland that we have you know, worked on, et cetera, et cetera. Have you found information that is useful or helpful and helped to calm those fears? Or is it kind of difficult to go there because nobody really knows yet? Some aspects of it are difficult in the sense that Trump so far has been so unpredictable. So people don't know how much of it is real, how much of it is a reality show, which at the end is not real. How ironic he would bring that up. And, and how much is just, just a real legitimate possibility and legitimate justifiable concerns. But something 
it's that at least Bronx leadership, I just came back from the Somos El Futuro Winter Which Conference. Which is gonna be my next topic in San of Juan. conversation. And actually, th in the conversation there, people were very um, strong in telling Bronx sites and people from all over New York, relax. Uh, for example, Attorney General Schneiderman said, no one, he told BronxNet Camera, no individual can single-handedly change the course of an entire nation. There are processes. So uh, first of all, they're calling uh, on people to come to their senses, you know, that, to rationalize. I have to that's partially true. That's right? partially that's, true. Yes, but okay. They're also making very strong calls to action to mobilize. Mm -hmm. they, they, they came with this slogan that people are using these days, don't agonize, organize. And pretty much, we live in a democracy. Um, Trump was elected president. Now we have to live with it. But we, uh, as, as citizens in a democracy, can make our voice heard. That SOMOS conference, which happens every year right after Election Day, I, I was not there. My s I can tell you, you got a slow start. <laughs> I was going to say, my <laughs> guess is on that Wednesday morning or you know later in the day as people arrive, there must have been a lot of depression. Because of course, I mean, it's no secret uh, the Bronx is essentially all Democratic. Uh, I mean, there are Republicans. In fact, we know in the East Bronx there were uh, some that supported Trump. But you, you could practically count on the fingers of you know one hand the number of uh, votes Trump got in the Bronx. Um, what was the initial talk? Did it take some doing this to get people to, to, to buck up a little bit? Or give, give us a well, sense Well, there of what was, it was a like. lot of shock. So people were completely numb. So there was very little conversation that very first morning when people were registering. People were uh, at the convention site at the Caribe Hilton. They were like congregating by TV sets waiting for Hillary Clinton's speech. Right. Uh, and also, the, the conference itself got a little late start because people delayed their flights yeah, in New York to figure these out yeah, and, and like, check how would it impact local communities. And even at a more personal level, people with families and young children, they delayed their flight to have serious conversations with their kids. Uh, then what would be a conclusion? Now, I realize you've, you've already drawn one of them, uh, which is, you know, let's not panic, let's get more information. Um, but by the end of the conference, which I guess went from like Wednesday to Sunday. To Sunday. Yeah. Um, what were conclusions? I mean, I mean we uh, actually used a uh, quote on this program, I think, a week ago about from the borough president. Um, what were our highest elected officials saying, people in the political uh, infrastructures and even in the business community saying about uh, the next president of the United States? In summary, uh, basically, they would like to approach um, the situation from two ends. They really need, number one, very strong, energized grassroots movement, vocalizing from the people who are watching from the people who TV are watching out there. Watching so now more than ever, it is extremely important that we embrace democracy and that we use it in a good, constructive way. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the second uh, strategy that they're going to go across is figuring out a way of opening the channels of dialogue with the new administration and uh, so they can at least have a back and forth and make the president aware of certain issues and mm -hmm. possibly try to establish a relationship. Now, some of the groups in New York do not have that kind of access to the president-elect. Well, of course. I, and, and I have to tell you, we're going to take a short break, and then we're going to talk about uh, uh, Trump's uh, speech, uh, which was on Tuesday about the first 100 days, um, his uh, plans for his first 100 days. Um, but, you know, with uh, Jeff Sessions' uh, uh, new prominence uh, in, in, and, and the, his rhetoric about Dominicans, uh, I mean, I, I, I'm sorry, uh, I understand the idea, don't be afraid and all that, but if you're a, a Dominican person or an Hispanic person in the Bronx or anywhere, you've got to look at that and say, wait a minute, uh, my country is appointing people who don't like me. That's uh, wholly un-American. There is no doubt it is a very difficult moment, and there are organizations like the Hispanic Federation who are now looking into national organizations who do have access to the White House, who do have access to the president-elect, and they're merging forces and uh, so they can get to him, and, and that's on the way. And keep the dialogue going. Uh, people of the Bronx, if you were f afraid before, maybe you're a little less afraid because we have two such great journalists <laughs> here. And uh, we are going to uh, talk about uh, uh, Trump's uh, speech from Tuesday about uh, the uh, first 100 days. Uh, with more on the Bronx Buzz right after this. Sure, I look cute now, but when my owner lost his job, it was rough. 
I was living on the street, and one night, me and this Cocker Spaniel got into it so bad, I wound up looking like an ice cream cone. I cried a little bit, but thankfully I got rescued, so I'm running, I'm jumping, all back to my old self. And I'm ready to give unconditional love, even if you put a lampshade on my head. It's not always easy being a dad. Do you have panda asthma too? Does that run in the family? This is the home of the most priceless kung fu artifacts. But when you make an effort... Dad, we're not supposed to touch anything. Oh, sorry. Go along, son! It's always worth it. Whoa, master! The smallest moments can have the biggest impact on a child's life. Take time to be a dad today. I am gonna get you. I'm gonna get you. Call 877-4DAD411 or visit fatherhood.gov to learn more. Hamilton was adopted from a rescue in 2008. He really likes to be around people. And as soon as I start to make my breakfast, Hamilton is right there. I get out my mat, and I'm doing a downward dog, and he's underneath. He's quite the pug about town. He gets invited to a lot of parties. He knows he's a pretty big deal. I mean, look at this little face. How could you not love him? Our neighbors and best friends. I love my sister. My heart, my heart is a sea race. race. Love, love is love. Our family is no less than any other family. Okay, back with you on the Bronx Buzz. As you know, every week we talk to uh, Bronx reporters and journalists, find out what they're thinking about, what they're talking about, help us all learn a little bit more, not only about them and their work, but about uh, the borough of the Bronx. Anthony Capote from uh, the Riverdale Press is with us, and uh, Javier Gomez from Bronxnet Television. The program is Dialogo uh, Abierto, uh, which I did not ask you before, and I want to do that before we get into our subject matter. Uh, when is it on, and because we should tell people when they can see it and where yes. and all that. Uh, Dialogo Abierto airs live on Wednesdays from 6.30 to 7 on Channel 67. People can always catch it online at bronxnet.org. I'll see the entire archive. And also, it's, it's re-cable cast um, throughout the week. Yeah, well, I know, <laughs> I know all about that. Bronx <laughs> talk is on there till I'm sick of it, you know. <laughs> um, and you do one every week? We do one new every week. Very good. Okay, so let's. Uh, we'll start with you, um, Javier. Um, uh, Donald Trump uh, said there were three things he was going to work on uh, in his first hundred days. He said he was going to uh, withdraw from TPP and the trade agreement. Um, he was going to cancel all restrictions on uh, various new forms of energy, shale energy, and uh, other uh, forms of energy because he wants to create jobs through an energy program, not using new technology, but frankly, old technology. And he, this was a, a fascinating conceptual thing uh, under the category of government being too intrusive. For every um, one regulation that we introduce, we're going to cancel two regulations. Uh, what are your thoughts? I mean, I don't know which one you want to hit first. But uh, well, <laughs> I know which one I would, but I'll let, let you guys Let me tell go you, first. there is a lot of work ahead of us for the next four years. Uh, now we are seeing um, his true colors. He's revealing it little by little by little. How much of it will change that we don't know because he uh, changes his minds uh, 
his mind drastically. I mean, Changed just, it, just yeah. on Tuesday morning, he had the meeting with the New York Times, he canceled the meeting with the New York Times, then he had the meeting with the New York Times. Right. So, so it was like the last person that talked to him, that's what he was. It's he really very to. interesting to watch. Um, go ahead. Now, so of those, what the, are you Of those, uh, I'm really puzzled about his uh, one new policy that he'll create by eliminating two. Uh, he he's already starting to reveal some of the indications of what he's going to do with civil service and there are going to be a lot of people screaming I can see he's going to change civic service civil service the way we knew it so he's shrinking and potentially government. excuse me potentially making it less attractive Com which, which would definitely get people into the private sector and out of the public sector but this is frankly the whole Republican effort to uh, make government smaller. I mean, he is really the right now champion. Completely. That. And now they're finding someone who might help them seriously get across the finish line. So um, it's been speculated that he's gonna. There's going to be a hiring freeze in all federal agencies. There's going to be some work in trying to sort of remove some power from the workers' unions. Right. And they're trying to create some sort of uh, merit. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, wa I want to bring uh, Anthony into the <coughs> conversation. So of those three, what jumps out at you? And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to weigh in myself. I'm a journalist, too. Um, <laughs> the, the two things that really jump out at me are, first, he talked a lot about um, manufacturing jobs, like steel production. And then that's how he started talking about his um, removal of restrictions on shale and what he calls clean coal. I will point. There is no such thing as clean coal. <laughs> by by oh. its nature, it's dirty. <laughs> by nature, it's dirty. That's why Santa gives it to naughty children. And, <laughs> um, so that stuck out at me as really something um, concerning because one of the great things about the end of the Obama administration is that he wanted to make that move towards. Renewable Cleaner energy, energy mm -hmm. clean sure. energy, things that aren't going to run out. In and and years. this was one of the things that it took Obama a long time to get to, mm -hmm. and now he finally got to it. And of course, it and of course could be it can go away. Well, I, I like uh, Javier. Uh, I am uh, concerned about this arbitrary idea. If I introduce a new regulation, I got to remove two. I mean, you, you, you can't just remove regulations because you, for the sake of it, you got to know what you're doing. But what I found was interesting: President Obama, before he left for um, uh, his last uh, trip overseas, he talked about, it's very easy to talk about uh, trade with Mexico and saying, we, you know, we want American goods. He said, but you have to realize that many of the parts that's, that are made at, at frankly, at, at cheap rates that save the auto industry are made in Mexico. So it's very easy to say, well, the Mexicans are going to have to pay for the wall and all that kind of stuff. But you've got to be very careful about it, you know, international trade because if you start uh, eliminating or getting them angry, guess what? You may collapse some aspects of American uh, uh, industry. And, and in this case, he was talking about the auto industry. He said it's like that in many other places. So it's very easy to say, as he said, put America first, um, you know, instead of the other countries. On the other hand, you could end up, uh, you know, the, the, with, with the worst of it. Listen, we could talk about this forever, mm -hmm. but uh, the program is not on forever. So uh, <laughs> Anthony Capote from the Riverdale Press, thank you so much. You. Javier Gomez, we're going to watch you. On, we're going to read you. Thank and we're going to watch you on TV <laughs> I'll every I'll continue Wednesday. watching you. There we go. It's a, it's a <laughs> team effort. And uh, for my friends and neighbors in the Bronx, guess what? We will see you next week right here for the Bronx Buzz and then Monday night for Bronx Talk. Stay there. Don't go. Thank you.